Hey everyone, I wanted to talk about an interesting article about declining female happiness. So the article I'm reading today is based on a paper wrote by, um, I think it's Betty Stevenson, and it's called the, well the article is called Gains in Women's Rights Haven't Made Women Happier, Why Is That? So it's based on a paper called The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. So the, the paradox is that in a world where we have more material opportunities and where, where the civil rights movement has offered more opportunities for ethnic minorities and where second wave and third wave feminism have opened the doors to, to kind of gender-based equality, why are women not happier? So just to jump straight into the article... Since the 70s, women in the US and Europe have reported feeling less satisfied with their lives. Women are outliving men in every country in the world. And again, I think the I think women live on average five to six years longer than men um, in the West. And uh, to continue on, despite facing higher levels of poverty than men, greater odds of encountering sexual violence and many additional diverse forms of discrimination... Uh, but while women are living longer, it's unclear whether their well-being is showing comparable strides. As women gain political, economic and social freedoms, one would expect that they should feel even more contented relative to men. But this isn't so. The paradox of declining female happiness was pointed out by economists Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, who also happen to share a house and kids. They analysed the happiness trends of US citizens between 1970 and 2005 and found surprising results. Stevenson and Wolfers discovered that American women rated their overall life satisfaction higher than men in the 1970s. So yeah, that's pretty much smack bang at the start of the Cultural Revolution and kind of the beginning of second wave feminism. So... This is largely predating many of the, the strides that feminism has or hasn't made. So it continues on. Thereafter, women's happiness scores decreased while men's happiness scores stayed roughly stable. By the 1990s, women were less happy than men. This relative unhappiness softened after the turn of the century, but men continue to enjoy a higher sense of subjective well-being that is at least as high, if not higher, than women's. Those 35 years saw advances in American women's rights and financial powers. For example, in 1974, Congress outlawed credit discrimination based on sex. In 1975, states were prevented from excluding women from duties. Until 1976, marital rape was legal in every US state. Over the 35-year period, women working full-time went from earning less than 60% of man's median salary to earning about 76% of it. Still an embarrassment for a country that aspires to be a mer- merito- Ooh, meritocracy, but an improvement nonetheless. And of course that weighs into the whole gender pay gap debate. Interestingly, we, you may measure the, the how much men and women have met, how much men and women make a, um, a salary per year. So men may make 24% more per year, but are they working longer? Are they working in more dangerous jobs? Are they working in more dirty jobs? Are they preferred? Are they prepared to work more overtime? Do women tend to balance other concerns and interests against work, like family, like partners, like whatever else? But you know that article doesn't go that far. So to continue on, the twenty years between nineteen eighty and two thousand saw a fivefold increase in the number of African American men in jail leading to more black men buying bars in the US than were enrolled in colleges and universities. Those kinds of statistics imply big changes to the marriage market. Although increased incarceration has affected African Americans more than others, even when all Americans are considered together, the rise in male incarceration between 1970 and 2000 has been responsible for a 13% drop in US marriage rates. The reduced pool of free men has also encouraged many women to accept marriage proposals from men they would otherwise rejected, an effect that has been shown to be sufficient 
to shift the economic advantage of marriage away from women towards men. <laughs> right, so, you know, the, the, the war on drugs that many people agree has probably been a negative thing has led to mass incarceration since the 1986 substance abuse. No, the, oh, what was it, the, the bill that Ronald Reagan passed? So it was 1986, it was the... Oh, I think it was... Oh, I think it was the Abuse of Subst Substances Act, 1986. Anyway, someone will correct me in the comments. But if we've seen this massive uptake in incarceration for black men, it's funny how the focus of this article is, well, this has been awful for women. Let's focus on how bad it's been for women, never mind the men who have just been eliminated from society. But to continue on. But putting more men in prison cannot fully explain the lessening happiness of American women, because women in other industrialised countries, which did not lock up nearly as many of their men, have also become less happy in recent decades. Stevenson and Wolfers found the gap between male and female happiness in Europe over approximately the same period had a strikingly similar trend in magnitude to the US gender happiness gap. So why is this? Evidence supports the idea that women's rights and roles in the home in the US and Europe have not moved in step with changes at the workplace. Therefore, because women with jobs often do most of the chores and childcare, they shoulder a dual burden that cuts into their sleep and fun. Long com commutes are thought to make British women more miserable than British men because of the greater pressure on women to meet responsibilities at home as well as work. And again, I think that's probably accurate. So in one study that I mentioned in a previous video, women perform, I think it's 93% of all domestic chores in, in, in household. And it's a point that Betsy Stevenson mentions in the paper, in which she calls that women are performing the, the double shift of obviously vocational work and domestic work. So that that's, again, most likely probably true. So to continue on, when the dual burden is carefully measured it has, as it has been across Europe, the results illustrate the influence that expectations have on happy, start that again. When the dual burden is carefully measured as it has been across European countries, the results illustrate the influence that expectations have on how happy we feel. Experiencing the dual burden leads working women in Sweden, for example, to feel more miserable than their counterparts in Greece probably because Swedish women's expectations around gender equality are more ambitious. Fewer than 35% of Sweden's women do three quarters of the household work, compared to 81% of Greek women. Expectations also lie behind the curious finding that performing household chores makes men statistically less likely to become depressed, but contributes to depression in women. Right. That's interesting. So taking on housework seems to encourage men to judge themselves as generally likeable, fair-minded dudes, kindly reducing their wife's load. On the other hand, taking on housework seems to make women feel exploited. Right, okay, that's kind of baffling. How are you supposed to win? Um, so if women are depressed because they do more household work, then you try and lessen the burden that they have to do. And that also makes women depressed, right? So makes me wonder what the solution actually is. But I think the point on increasing expectations is especially salient. And I think as well that when, so this is a point I've discussed with the YouTuber Misha Petrov, that there's a, when you live in a society where women expect ever more from those in power, they demand more, they feel like they're being denied much of what they are really should have and what, what they ought to have. It makes complete sense that if you fall into this Hegelian dialectic where you view those at the top as just masters and you're you're just enslaved, you're oppressed, you've been reduced to just some sort of commodity, which is an argument that Peter Hitchens also makes that it makes complete sense that you feel as if you're just being exploited and that your sole purpose in life is to raise awareness about your oppression and it's to get more and more from the society that is deemed to exploit you. And again, that makes perfect sense. 
why even though the material conditions have improved for women, why they are not any happier because they they feel like this is one step in a, in a long road to overturning the patriarchy or to obliterating their oppressors and it would make sense why we see this trend across the west and across developed nations because when you increase expectations they become almost impossible to satisfy and I think it's probably a very key part of how we should try and frame social policy in the future. We cannot view each other or we cannot view society as this, as this battle between the oppressed and the oppressors because it just creates an entitled class of people that demand more and more and they don't feel any better. That's the salient point. You're not going to reach fulfillment by waging some ideological war. But again, that's to kind of drift off a little bit from the point. So just to continue on. So it says, different parts of Switzerland voted very differently. Unsurprisingly, cantons, so Swiss states, with a high proportion of votes in favor of amendment were recorded as having a small gender wage gap some years later, but strangely working women in areas with strong traditional values where most people who had voted against equal pay were happier than working women in liberal cantons. And again that makes sense. They don't view the world as this ideological struggle. They don't think they're being denied something. Actually they're probably much more grateful for what they do have rather than rueful for what they don't have. So just to continue on, um, so we're just at the end of the article. So it says, This inside out result probably arises from different cognitive comparisons. Women in liberal communities are less happy and notice discrimination because they automatically compare their opportunities and salary to everyone else around them, men included. Traditionally minded women perhaps base their identities more firmly on their gender roles. <gasps> the shock! Who knew that gender roles may actually have a beneficial effect? And think only of other women when they evaluate their privilege and opportunities. Oh, God. This kind of difference might explain the lessening happiness of American women as women's rights and opportunities have increased. It seems reasonable that women in industrialised countries have internalised ever more complex and optimistic expectations and judge reality against these. Asked how satisfied she is with her lot in life, the household, the housewife of the early 1970s probably just reflected on whether things were going well at home. The same question today evokes evaluations across many areas of life. Of life. Declining happiness among women may seem depressing, but whoever claimed an expanded consciousness brings satisfaction. And it's a fair point. Um... So, again, it's a, it's a fair point, as we become more aware of our surroundings, as we develop this comparison mindset, it makes complete sense why we're no longer happy, because if you live your life evaluating your own situation according to others, if you think that the grass is always greener, then why would you be happy? Why would you be content? Your whole mission is to, is to cross the field and to get to, to greener pastures, especially when you believe there's a moral imperative to do so. So it makes complete sense. And uh, just to, I think it's a very interesting article, but what it, a point that it fails to mention is that I don't think this boils down to one single causal factor. As, they, as the authors mention in the paper, there's probably many interrelated, though kind of distinct causal factors that explain the decline in female happiness over the, over the past few decades. So I think we consider so Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. So he is a kind of a social psychologist who argued that in order to live a fulfilling life, we need to meet 
certain key milestones in our in the kind of in during the development of our lifespan. So which takes me to an interesting statistic. So in a journal or in an article from the Wall Street Journal, it says that the most likely group of or the most likely demographic to take antidepressants is middle aged women. So it says about one in five women aged aged forty to fifty nine and nearly one in four women aged sixty and over used antidepressants in the last thirty days during twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen. And that's compared to so women aged eighteen to thirty nine were about one in ten, so about half the rate of middle aged women and men were around eight point four percent of those aged forty to fifty nine and twelve point eight percent of those aged sixty and older. So we're talking about more than double the the prevalence or the rate between middle aged women and middle aged men when it comes to taking antidepressants. And I think that takes me to kind of Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. So when we when we look at the key kind of milestones or the crisis, the psycho uh, the psychosocial crisis that Eric Erickson calls it. So of women as they approach 40 they have a struggle between intimacy and isolation so women really are having to evaluate to what extent they are prepared to give up their career in order to cultivate a family to pursue fulfilling romantic relationships or whether they're going to abandon those social connections and pursue just a life of work and as they move into their 40s, 50s and 60s, the crisis moves on to genera generativity and stagnation. So Eric Erickson calls this basically the struggle for kind of a lasting legacy or significance or to feel like they have an impact on the lives of others. And it makes complete sense when you look at the statistics. So the average age of women and men entering into their first marriage is increasing so it's around 29 whereas it was probably early 20s when we go back to the 1960s and 70s the average age of having the first child again is around 28 to 29 in the uk and i think in the us as well so women especially are are delaying the sort of kind of major lifestyle changes they're no longer entering into these kind of deeply meaningful social relationships. So they're being starved of intimacy. And a kind of a very key source of, of self-fulfillment. So I think it's around 50% of women in the UK or just over 50% of women. I think it's in the UK and the US are aged 30 and over are not married and they don't have children. So these people don't have any long-term relationships or they don't have marriage, rather I should say. They're not married and they don't have children. So you have to seriously wonder what is it that gives their life a sense of meaning? And again, this is a point that Misha Petrov and kind of other people as well, kind of, I guess, more conservative thinkers have suggested as well that we're really training women to behave like stereotypical men that your life is about obsessively focusing on your career. It's about being incredibly driven. It's about having a type A personality and being a boss bitch. Sure, that'll work for plenty of women and for plenty of men. But for those that want deeper connection, none of our societal incentives are aligned to this need. And it makes sense why women end up in their 40s and 50s on antidepressants at higher rates than every other demographic it's because they realise they've actually lost out on something very sacred they've lost out on social connection they've lost out on having a child and having a family unit and these are the most personal and intimate relationships you'll ever have in your life and it takes people just perhaps a decade or two too long to realise that but of course I think there's many other factors so what 
Betsy Stevenson found in, in that study is that the decline in female happiness cuts across all age groups and it cuts across I think all demographics whether it's social class or educational status so we've seen from the 1970s where women were generally happier than men to basically the turning point in the 1990s where women where women's happiness has declined both in absolute terms and relative to men so now men are deemed to be kind of subjectively based on the general uh, satisfaction survey where they report having higher levels of subjective well-being and I think there's again many causes which takes me to another paper if I can find it by Helen Sweeting, Robert Young and Patrick West so they performed a study a longitudinal study from the 19 I think it was 1987 yeah from 1987 to 2006 and they issued, they administered the general health questionnaire. So this is basically, I think it's a 12 item survey or questionnaire, basically asking them to evaluate their own subjective sense of well-being, how useful they feel they are, how stressed they feel they are, whether they've been able to get sleep and kind of other kind of metrics to explore their kind of subjective sense of well-being. And what they found, is that from 1987 to, if I can just find the results. So what they found in the general health questionnaire, so specifically the rates for caseness. So caseness was basically whether an individual developed scores suggestive of maybe developing a mental health disorder that would require further treatment in a medical setting. So to go into the results, specifically the rates for caseness quadrupled for girls from 6.6% 6 .6 to 18.4% in 1999. So it was originally around 6% in 1987 and then it quadrupled and finally to 26.7% in 2006. So we're talking about an almost five-fold increase in caseness or in the prevalence of mental health disorders. And for boys, boys demonstrated no statistically significant increase from 1987 to 1999 but conversely their rates of caseness also doubled from 5.5 in 1999 to 10.2% in 2006. So we see an increase in basically mental health disorders and symptoms that are associated with mental health disorders increasing quite rapidly for both genders. So this was among 15 year old boys and girls in a school in uh, just outside Glasgow. So that's a, a city based in Scotland. So there was an increase in kind of mental health disorders among both demographics, but it's much, much more pronounced among girls or in this study, adolescent girls. Which is interesting as well when you think of the technological changes that we've experienced in the 90s and specifically in the 2000s with the rise of the internet and social media and technologies of that sort which takes me to kind of an interesting argument made by I think it's the psychologist Nicky Crick who basically argues that perhaps one way or she doesn't necessarily argue at this point but I think we can make the argument based on her um, theoretical assumptions so she says that men and women are roughly equally as aggressive as each other but men demonstrate their aggression physically through the violence through I guess sport or any other kind of kinetic physical altercation whereas women generally express their violence through relationships she calls this relational aggression so rather than punching their best friends they will try and destroy and ravage their reputation whether it's slut shaming or saying that they're not cool or in some way trying to socially ostracize them from their in group. And I think this is perhaps a very critical causal factor in why especially younger girls are experiencing levels of kind of declining subjective well being in relation to boys. Especially when we consider that the 
the 1990s and the early 2000s brought us social media, specifically Facebook was launched in 2005 and while smartphones didn't really become mainstream until 2007, 8, 9, we still see kind of widespread access in the home. So we see Facebook and MySpace and Bebo infiltrate the domestic environment and that's critical because this turns kind of classroom discussions and arguments into a kind of a digital coliseum where reputations are kind of violently won and lost in front of kind of a growing audience of their peers or of their classmates and there's just a great spectacle and really a great resource for bullying and for relational aggression that's now opened up to teenage girls really from the late 90s to a lesser extent with computers and kind of chat rooms and stuff like that to a very powerful kind of digital coliseum in the 2000s with Facebook and again when you take this when you scale this up to kind of the world of smartphones and Twitter and Snapchat and TikTok there's an ample battleground to to destroy basically your female classmates and this isn't a form of aggression that men are as predisposed to engage in so that may that might be one factor in why kind of adolescent and young adult females have experienced declining happiness so really interesting I, I recommend everyone kind of reads uh, Nikki Crick's work on this particular issue but of course I think there are many more causal explanations and I think most of the causal factors can either be divided divided into economic factors or maybe more spiritual factors so there's interesting kind of studies on with more women earning degrees so around 60% of all university graduates are women and again these numbers only increase the higher up you go so I think um, around I think around half of PhD candidates are also women, but this number has been growing quite significantly. And also when you consider as well that women have entered kind of the workforce and that so from, I think it's from 1970, that around 59% of women were in the labour force and that's jumped up to around, I think it's 73%. And again, you take all of these factors and it creates this kind of phenomenon of economically unattractive men because women typically want to date someone that earns at least as much as they do, if not more, that has basically a value, that a, a sexual market value, to kind of, to use that phrase, that's at least on par, if not higher than their own. So this creates an ever-shrinking pool of eligible bachelors that they can date from. So this again denies them kind of social connection, the sense that they they have some sort of purpose, that they can care and intend to others, that they can have an influence on in the lives of other people, that they can have some sort of lasting legacy in, in the eyes of others. And again, I think there's just myriad economic factors that you can explore. I think more interestingly, again, this is a point that I've kind of discussed with the YouTuber Misha Petrov, is just the lack of any spiritual fulfillment or awareness. We live in a society where it's characterised by destructive impulses. So there's a, a, a very well-known concept within Buddhism called the, I think it's the, 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 the free roots of evil or the free poisons of evil. So it's so the three roots of evil are kind of the general cause of suffering in the Buddhist mindset. So these are kind of greed and desire, which is represented by the rooster. They are ignorance or delusion, which is represented by the pig. And perhaps even more importantly, is hatred and destructive urges represented by the snake. And these all feed into each other. So greed and desire, kind of feeds into ignorance and delusion because really the only thing people care about in the West 
and I'd say women are being taught to care about more and more is just their own career, it's their own personal success, nothing else matters, there are no other concerns, there are no other motivations, there's nothing else you need for fulfillment, you just need to be a boss bitch, you need to be a corporate man. And this ignorance and delusion leads to this mindset that, well, if I strive for this, I'll lead to a life of happiness. But it, then it creates these destructive urges because, nope, you're denying very key aspects of your nature. Not only for women, I would argue for men as well, that striving for material success will only take you so far in the path to well-being and fulfillment. And this creates, again, a sense of dissatisfaction at life. Probably many of the problems we see as well with substance abuse, with people largely living for the weekend, with, again, overly casual sexual relationships that leads to very little with any fulfillment, and then it leads to hatred. Because the easiest thing to do with self-hatred, rather than reflecting on yourself and your own journey, is to externalise that hatred and to attribute all of the world's problems, all of your own problems, onto some other group or onto society at large. And we are masters at this in the 21st century. This kind of victimhood complex, it became this seeming cure-all for all of our problems across all demographics or all sects in the political um, spectrum. It's far easier to blame your opponent for your own suffering than it is to take productive steps towards a more fulfilling life. And we see that constantly. And it's really marked by a lack of reverence and respect. We don't care about others. We don't care about our ancestors. There's a, a great quote, I wish I could remember the author. Um, so it's from a, a Korean philosopher that when we no longer respect our ancestors, how can we be expected to respect the man on the street? And it makes complete sense that we have no reverence for our history, for our ancestors, for in America the Founding Fathers, or for anyone that's perhaps built up the nation that we now live in, we just view it as a vessel for oppression. And that is completely antithetical to a good, fulfilling life. You need to be able to practice some level of gratitude and appreciation. And that's what kind of the Buddhist philosophy, the Confucian philosophy teaches, that for Confucianism that we are a relational being, we're not this atomistic individual. We live in relation to other people. We depend on other people for surviving and flourishing. And that's why we are supposed to exercise reverence for our ancestors and for our family, because without them, we are not, we do not exist, we're not who we are. And it's only through kind of, kind of emphasizing or cultivating this sense of gratitude and appreciation for what the world has provided you that you can ever live a psychologically balanced life. But if you just demand more and more, you're just going to feel less and less fulfilled. And again, in Buddhism as well, it's all about escaping these kind of, kind of these roots of evil, these poisons. And it's about being able to live more, again in the moment, more mindfully, more passively, rather than actively trying to shape the world in some way that you think it ought to be. It's about being able to allow the world to seep into your own self, to realise that actually many of the luxuries you do experience in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's just a basic appreciation for the nature around you, for the people that have helped, raise you in some sense for the fact that you have life at all but none of these basic goods matter when you view life as a war between the oppressed and and its oppressors so I think it's something that if there's any antidote 
to the current degeneracy of the West for the declining sense of subjective well-being among both men and women it's probably going to be found in some sort of philosophical tradition a tradition that emphasizes gratitude reverence for something larger than ourselves. it doesn't have to be a god but even just for nature or for the social world we find ourselves in and we have to just look at america and how polarized it is now it's very similar to the climate crisis if you don't respect the climate if you don't take the appropriate steps to safeguard the climate then you end up at a point of no return and your natural world begins to fall apart and it's the exact same in the social world that's why philosophers like confucius emphasize the importance of rituals of social norms of behaving in appropriate ways because if you don't behave in appropriate ways your society will crumble you will lose all social cohesion and harmony you will end up in a state of complete degeneracy and eventually a state of nature when your when your empire collapses so there's like I'll wrap this up. I'm aware that this video has been on for a while, but there's a great video by Ray Diallo, and it's on, he calls it the big cycle, and it's on basically the principles for rising and declining empires. I'll add a link to this video um, in the description, but he basically argues that there's a lot of key factors, but kind of some of the core social factors needed for uh a stable empire like say the US is civility religious and legal institutions and some sense of joint social purpose and we have none of those in the West civility is dead chivalry is dead religion has been dead for 50 plus years and we have absolutely no sense of shared kind of human centred goals or aspirations and I find that's really the the project that society needs to take up if we want any really greater sense of satisfaction in our own lives but yeah I just want to say thank you again for listening to this incoherent ramble but if you like this video and if you want me to explore this topic more deeply and I can have in a video essay give the video a like comment in the comment section below if you can contribute anything to the Patreon, I would greatly appreciate that. So I just want to say, again, thank you to the YouTuber Misha Petrov, who just kind of helped me formulate some of these thoughts um, over the past few days. And uh, in the next video, I'm going to be doing a video essay on the incel movement and how mental health influences one's sense of social identity and how that, I argue, leads to... Um, espousing the incel movement and kind of more of the radical beliefs. I think that's an interesting issue that not many people have discussed. What is the pathway from kind of mental illness or mental health disorders to the ideological beliefs we find in the incel movement? So if you are interested in that, please say so in the comment section below. But again, thank you for watching. Take care.